Certains appellent notre époque l'ère de l'information. Maintenant que près de 60% de la population mondiale a accès à Internet, que des milliards d'objets sont connectés en permanence, la masse d'informations qui est produite chaque jour est quasiment inimaginable. Et de fait, nous avons créé une civilisation moderne, mondiale, des systèmes et des modes de vie qui dépendent des technologies numériques et d'Internet pour fonctionner. Et pourtant, la plupart d'entre nous n'y comprennent rien. On sait à peu près utiliser les outils, les mails, les réseaux sociaux, etc., mais on ne sait, on sait pas ce qu'il y a derrière. On fait souvent aveuglément confiance à l'État et aux entreprises pour gérer et stocker nos données et pour faire en sorte que ça marche, alors qu'on devrait certainement regarder tout ça de beaucoup plus près. Keren et Lazari fait partie de ceux qui comprennent comment marchent ces technologies numériques. Elle se définit elle-même comme une hackeuse bienveillante, une friendly hackeuse dans le texte. Pour elle, être un, un hacker, une hackeuse est avant tout un état d'esprit, une manière de voir le monde qui consiste à vouloir comprendre vraiment comment fonctionnent les choses, afin de pouvoir soi-même les modifier si besoin, et afin de contribuer à mettre à jour les failles de nos systèmes pour pouvoir les corriger. Keren est une analyste en cybersécurité reconnue internationalement, elle est aussi auteure, conférencière et conseille certaines des plus grandes organisations ainsi que des gouvernements sur leur stratégie de sécurité. Nous parlons ensemble de sa manière de regarder le monde, d'Internet et de l'omniprésence de l'information numérique et des risques liés à la non-protection des données, de nos données, pour nous-mêmes et pour les systèmes dont nous dépendons. Je ne sais pas si vous êtes au courant, mais le monde il vous attend pas. Le monde il bouge. Et il bouge vite. Bienvenue sur Sismic. Rien de tout ça n'est réel Qu'est-ce que le réel Quelle est ta définition du réel Chaque génération, sans doute, se croit vouée à refaire le monde. Notre savoir nous a fait devenir cyniques. Nous sommes inhumains à force d'intelligence. L'humanité est menacée dans ses fondamentaux. Tu dois trouver dans tes rêves l'avenir pour lequel tu as envie de te battre. Ok, so hello Karen. Hi, hello Julien. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Uh, so you define yourself as a friendly hacker, and we'll, we'll get back to that a bit later. But uh, most of your work today revolves around uh, the cyber world, and uh, more precisely, about your job is about cybersecurity, which is a, a topic on which you talk, on which you advise many corporations and organizations. And so I want to talk with you today about your vision of this world, the cyber world that we know pretty much. We, I mean, we we all live in it, or at least we spend a lot of time, you know on the internet, on the cyber world, but we don't really know it for most of us. Um, and, and that is what I want to be talking about, you know, what's happening there and what are the, the risks related to, to, to what's going on there. So the first question I always ask is, um, how do you look at the world? What is your, what are your main, your main angles, you know, the, the glasses you wear to look at the world and, uh, and why? Fantastic question. So for me, my point of view of the world as a hacker, I always try to see the infrastructure of the that's underlying everything. So whenever I'm walking down the street, I try and imagine, I, I look at the way the cars, the people, the public park, how everything is connected. Even, even when I go for a, a walk in nature in my local public park, I notice the router, the wireless router that City Hall has set up in front of one of the <laughs> benches to create a co-working space for people outside in the park because of COVID-19. So these are the types of things that I always notice. It's almost like in the movie, The Matrix. I feel like I walk around the world and I can imagine an overlay of information technology and communications everywhere we go and even as i think about ourselves you mentioned we all live in the digital world the digital world is part of us we are all cyborgs in a way because we rely on connected technology in the past year more than ever more than ever it's allowed us to thrive throughout the pandemic so a device like this or like this like my phone or my computer or a tablet, for many people, this is more close than a family member in some cases. We wake up with these devices. We go to sleep with these devices. We share our lives with dozens of digital devices that are now in our household. And for most people, there are more digital devices than family members in their home. So that's our new reality. So you see what we tend to forget most of the time, which is the fact that we have a physical life and a virtual life we have uh, if, because even we, when we are not online we are still there 
we still have information about us and there is still something going on basically and, and you manage to to see the world through that lens the fact that we have two worlds two layers together that's right yeah yeah th it's like okay. another dimension to our lives we have our, yeah, okay. our physical lives which we live in our homes in our cities in our villages but we also have our digital lives like the matrix like this virtual environment and that information that flows some of it is ours we believe that we own it but really mm -hmm. we we don't own most of that data we have yeah. generated a lot of that data but somebody else owns it usually a big yeah. corporate an innovative corporate even the robotic vacuum machines the little you know the yeah i won't say the name but yeah, the, the, the brand cleaning up cleaning up the house exactly yeah. the, the little robots that people have in their houses today they collect a lot of information about the layout of the house the structure of the house in some cases they know when you're home when you're not home how you use your electricity all of that information is not yours it's owned by the company that made that vacuum cleaner the new devices that people bring into their lives today like Alexa, for example, or virtual assistants that have a physical form, mm -hmm. like a little gadget, they usually have a microphone and they are in our rooms, in our lives, and they capture a lot of information about us. And of course, they know a lot about our digital lives because we have our accounts, our Amazon yep. accounts, or our Google account, or our Facebook account. And the information together with the data that's captured in our home environment is quite a lot. And we don't own any of yeah, that. And that, that's what I want to talk about in the next uh, minutes we have together, that, that other layer, that other dimension that represents today most of the information that is generated and that we don't really understand. And that some people understand, some people use, and I think it's really necessary for everyone to, to, to get it, a little bit more of it. So um, to go back a little bit, you know, when you think about digital technology and the accelerated development of the internet and its ad mass adoption over the past 20 years, we can see that how, how much this has changed the world, you know, how it works. And uh, of course, this has a lot to do with information, as you mentioned, how it's produced, captured, shared, used. Can we first talk about this, you know, the the basics? What is the relationship between digital technology, the internet, information and how the world works in general so the internet was started as a way to transfer and share information across academic institutions and research institutions and as such it was never really designed for privacy it was designed for the opposite of that it was designed for connectivity for sharing for openness and over the years, it evolved, just like humanity evolves, only for technology, evolution happens at a much faster rate. For you and me and for our ancestors, evolution takes place over thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. For technology, it takes place over days or, or weeks. And the internet evolved within a few years from being one tool for academics and libraries and research institutions to share information, it became the platform for everything that we do and for so much of the human experience. In a way, you could even say that uh, our brand of humans, the humans of the information age, we are evolutionarily different from our predecessors. The children that are born today that are digital natives their lives are very fundamentally different from the lives of children who are born without digital technology and connectivity everywhere. And you and I, Julianne, we are the what we call, in, in Judaism, we are what we call the desert generation because of the famous story of how the, the people of Israel uh, had an exodus go across yes exactly an exodus from egypt to israel over 40 years and they spent 40 years in the desert so the desert generation are the people that knew the past life and were looking forward to the new life and the generation that came after was brand new they didn't remember they didn't know what was life like before the exodus so you and i and the, the people that are a little bit older than us certainly 
we are that desert generation before the new age of humans comes about that were their lives they cannot imagine an unconnected reality it would simply be impossible mm-hmm. for them except for maybe some groups of people you know certainly it's important to remember that there are still billions of people around the world that are not connected and they are in that desert generation but i don't think it's going to take 40 years to connect everybody it's going to take a lot less than that in, in fact according to most of the reports and the estimates we're going to have more connected people on this planet in in just you know a few years and we're going to have 10 times more digital devices on planet earth than human beings so we're going actually to become the the planet of the machines whether we like it or not how do you how do you uh bridge what you just said with the idea of information because you can you can argue that throughout history um, information was the key factor of change you know you can you can describe how history evolves by how in, information flows you know who owns it how fast it goes where it goes because this is how ideas travel how inventions happen you know like etc uh, etc et and today Uh, the nature of how what is the information and how it flows and where it goes is very much different from what it was just uh, 30 years ago and can we talk about that concept of information related to power related to innovation and um, what is it that we usually don't understand on how information is shared controlled and used today Fantastic topic. So if we consider access to information and the ability to transmit information and to broadcast information, maybe to the next generation, in the previous decades, in the previous millennia of human experience, that access was really tightly controlled. Usually it was the ruling class, whether it was kings or priests, or other religions, there was usually a small group within the population that could really write the books. They could write history, and they could take care of their legacy. Even today, most of what we know about ancient Egypt comes from whatever the kings who were in power decided to write on the walls. We don't know a lot more than that, right? Because that's what they decided the information that should be kept for posterity. And that was the reality for for most of humanity, for most of the time that humanity has existed. And in the past few years, certainly in the last uh, century, in the 20th century, and of course with mass communication, suddenly there's an explosion of information. And now in the information age, we can all have access to information and we can all generate information. And there's Apparently, it seems like there are no limits to sharing information, to generating information, to creating information, to consuming information. But I think that's a little bit of an illusion because, okay. in fact, today, <laughs> you don't really have access to all of the information in the world. There are still some groups, maybe not individuals, maybe we don't call them royalty or kings or priests, But there are definitely corporates that decide and can control what you can access and how much of it you can access. And more than the companies, the algorithms are the kings. Because the algorithms that decide what you see in your social media or what you see in your Google search or what you see even on the news, it it didn't get there from nowhere. An algorithm somehow generated or helped a story float to the top of everything. Because there's so much information, the organizations that can control what becomes the ruling story, what becomes the lead story, they have even more power, right? And and mm-hmm. it's, very, it's mm-hmm. very tempting to think that everything has been democratized and that we all have equal access to data and equal control to data. The reality is it's a little bit more like a feudal structure, a little bit more like a feudal situation, feudal in the sense of of the old uh, way where I think a lot of European nations operated in a feudal structure where there was there were a few people that held power. Let's call them organizations, houses, like the house of mm-hmm. uh, such and such lord or, or such and such baron. And they had control over some land. And the people who lived on that land generated produce, they generated an agricultural uh, 
uh, product, and they got to enjoy some of that, but most of that went back to the feudal lords. In a similar way, I could claim that in the digital realm, we're all living on somebody else's land. Even right now, you and I are communicating via some platform. Yeah. The platform has given you the ability to use it. Maybe you even pay some, you know, some fee to use the platform. But a lot of what we generate online is actually not ours. It's not owned by us. And it generates revenue. It creates produce. It creates value for the overlords. And the overlords are usually the big technology companies. In most cases, not in all cases. And of course, there are very important nonprofits like Wikimedia Commons, the Wikipedia organization that bring more information to more children and people all over the world that was perhaps accessible in the past. So there are some exemptions to the feudal digital society. Yeah. But and, and yes. This is what you mentioned earlier. You know, you can you can argue that information is power. It's always been, as you mentioned, you know, like you had a, a few people that were having access to information and using it uh, to, to dominate, you know, like and to create history, basically. And today there is so much information that we can have the impression that it's, uh, um, we, we, you know, power back to the people in a sense, because it's true that we've never been accessed. We never had access to so much information if we want to have access to it. But also, the information has never been so centralized in a sense, meaning uh, the power given to a few people, and we think about the, the big tech corporations have so much capability to use, to gather, and to use this information in, in a very new way. You can argue that they have never been any organization with so much power. Mm. Right. So, so I can think we, what's changed you, yeah, here, it, it, yeah, I think what's yeah. changed really is also the scale. So if you contrast life in the definitely in the medieval times, but even before medieval times, life in the Renaissance. Let's imagine that there were a thousand kings and queens, 10,000 kings and queens and princes and lords and priests that were controlling a lot of the information, even a hundred thousand. Today, you probably have less than 100,000 technology companies that control yep a vast amount of, of people's information and access to information. And, and yet it, there is that illusion, right, that billions of people can communicate freely, share information, consume information, where actually that's not the case. The difference, of course, is that for many of these technology companies, they're not private, they're publicly owned. And so I, in fact, yeah. whilst I'm speaking to you and criticizing some of these technology companies, I might also be holding stock in Amazon or yeah, Microsoft sure. or Facebook or uh, Netflix, etc. So there is a difference there. The analogy is not perfect, like any analogy. It's not perfect. It's not like uh, a complete and utter loss of control. And you could argue that through uh, stock ownership, more people can now have a piece of that power. Of course, it's arguable how much I can control Amazon's decision by, you know, I, I have five of their stock that doesn't necessarily yeah. make me someone who's in control or in power. But this would be an argument that somebody would make if they were going to say, no, it's not feudal at all. Everybody has access to power these days. What, you know, there is a phrase that we hear sometimes, which is data, which is information is the new oil. Uh, meaning that it's uh, it fuel. I, we just we just talked about it later, but I want to make sure that we go I into depth. Um, you know, for companies, for the world, for for government, it's a source of power. As just uh, we just mentioned, can we go into this? And also, um, I would like you to to, to say a few words on the, um, what happened because you know, in the early days of the internet, we had th the first hackers. You know, like Steve Wozniak or even uh, Aaron Swartz a bit later, were having that vision free information that would end up uh, help us creating perfect democracies, kind of. And as you mentioned, this is not the case. So what happened? And uh, yeah, word on the data is the new old thing. So I'll start with the second question. The internet was, 
it was born out of an experiment led by the American government, something called DARPANET or ARPANET, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It's part of the American military organization, part of the Department of Defense, together with research institutes. So let's not forget that. It didn't start as a grassroots movement with everybody around the world suddenly creating this new technology. Yes, it took advantage of creators and people like um, uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who was oftentimes called the father of the internet because he created the protocol of of HTTP and, and HTML. But there were a lot of people who contributed, but it wasn't that democratized to begin with. It was a very American, UK, European-centered project. And I think one of the first connections between the US and Europe was to CERN, to the, the research facility yeah. in Switzerland. So it, it wasn't really built to serve everybody and become an incredible library of knowledge that everybody could access. It was meant to serve an elite. It was meant to serve research institutes and academics. And it grew. That's when it became democratized. It grew and it grew and more people started adding connections until it kind of came out of the control of one central government. It came somewhat out of the control of, of the U.S. government or the any European government that you might mention. However, there is still quite a lot of control that governments to this date have over the World Wide Web and the global internet, which is one of the reasons that the people who, who, it's one of the reasons that the dark net emerged. It's supposed to be an alternative, an internet that is decentralized, an internet that's not controlled. Unfortunately, the dark net has also become a home for a lot of criminal and malicious activities. And it is in of itself, also not completely democratized because it's based on a particular technology, the Onion Router, Tor, as some of you might know it. And Tor, mm -hmm. again, a project that was originally started by the American Navy. So we should not be too naive here. These technologies would not have been started if not for a very well-funded government agency probably as part of a strategic, global, geopolitical move. It's, it's not like they were started as some sort of democratic initiative to engage yeah, everybody sure. in the world, uh, regardless of what they say. So this is, this is with regards to your second question. Now, the first question was about how data is the new oil. And a lot of people in Silicon Valley have been saying this in the past few years. They've also been saying that software is eating the world. So if software is eating yeah. the world, it's taking over a lot of our activities, the byproduct of all that eating is all that data, and that data is becoming extremely valuable as a resource, and it's the reason that companies do what they do, create what they create so that they can generate more data, and the data creates more revenue, and so goes the cycle. And hopefully, somehow in that cycle, our lives as humans are improved with all of that data. Mm -hmm. Somehow it benefits our life, which I think is a, an assumption that needs to be looked at very, <laughs> you know, very carefully. Does it really improve our lives? Does all of this massive collection of data translate into benefits for us, the people who are the engine that creates all of this data? So I want to say one more thing on this topic. If data is the new oil, then data breaches are like oil spills. And companies that can't protect all the data that they collect are creating a catastrophic ecosystem damage, just like an oil spill. And they should be held accountable to this environmental digital damage that they create. I call on companies, if you can't protect it, don't collect it. And for us as, individual, as individuals who make decisions, when we give out our data, just imagine how you might feel when all of that, the data is, is out there somewhere spilled. How would you feel about that? Maybe different. So that's just some, something to, to think about for you and for your listeners. Yeah, and I will spend more time talking about this now. Um, because, I mean, I, our information online represents much more than we tend to think. Uh, our photos, our emails, our you know location records, our chats, all these tells a lot about who we are, what we think, and what we do as you as you 
you know, mentioned. And this, in, this information is supposed to be secured, right? Otherwise, we would not share it in the first place. But it's actually not so much as we can, as we will talk through now. Because the platforms on, on which we live it are actually using it to know us and sometimes manipulate us in, in, in a sense. And, and that was what also the Cambridge Analytica scandal was about, you know, when it appeared that Facebook could be used to influence an election. And also because governments are spying on us, especially, you know, the US with the immense capacities, capabilities that they have. And, and we, we know this clearly since Snowden, basically. And on top of it, there is even maybe worse case, which is when the information we leave can be used by pirates, you know, to blackmail us or, you know, in any different ways. Um, we'll go into cybersecurity, which is your, 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 your topic. Can, we, can you talk about these different types of risks for normal people and corporations? Because they are not the same type of risks. You know, how you, I'm not sure if this is the right way to categorize it. How do you look at these different types of uh, of, of the different natures of risk. So the type of risk is not the same, but the things that we can do about it can be similar. So as individuals, we are at risk of having our information taken away from us. We are at risk as ha at having our information somehow used against us. We are at risk of becoming a pawn in a fraud or a criminal attempt that steals our identity and uses our name, our likelihood, our details in another elaborate criminal attack. So there are a lot of ways that we could actually be attacked in the digital realm. For companies, usually the, the biggest threat traditionally, classically, maybe before COVID, before C BC, right? In the before co Corona times, the before COVID <laughs> time. In the BC age, the traditional threat for most organizations was that their crown jewels would be stolen. For a company like Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. maybe the secret recipe for Coca-Cola is their crown jewels. For a fashion designer, the secret, uh, the, the fashion creations are the intellectual property, that's the crown jewels. For a company that makes a video game, the source code for their upcoming game that's not been released yet. So for each company, a little bit of a different crown jewels, but essentially in most cases, it was intellectual property. Now what's been added to that intellectual property is also all of that data that they collected about us and our choices. That's so valuable, valuable data. And those assets, these digital assets, the intellectual property and the data are traditionally, classically what a company wishes to protect. Now what we have discovered through the COVID transformation is that even the simplest thing of access, of digital connectivity, of having the ability to reach your data, of having your websites up and running, of having your applications running, even that is actually more valuable for a lot of companies, which is why we are now seeing the surge of attacks like ransomware where the business model for ransomware is a criminal is going to take away your access to your systems and then sell it back to you. It's almost the perfect crime. It's brilliant. It's criminal and malicious, but it's brilliant. They don't have to steal anything except for your mm -hmm. access to your own data. And what companies have discovered, lo and behold, throughout the past year, is that they are willing to pay millions and millions of dollars to have that access risk recovered and restored within hours instead of spending two weeks or three weeks or a month or more on trying to recover all of their systems database by database from their backups and their files. And indeed, that's one of the reasons that ransomware is so successful because, because companies really can't deal without access to, the, to their infrastructure. Mm. So that, that's something that has changed. And I think that for most of us, that's not as much of a threat because I could tell you, Julianne, uh, how much would you pay me if I took away your access to all of your systems tomorrow for 24 hours or 48 hours? Heck, you might even pay me. We'll call it a Buddhist retreat, mm -hmm. right? And I know, <laughs> I know some friends that are paying quite a lot of money just to be away from their digital devices for a weekend and taking the time to do yoga and meditate and, and chant and eat uh, 
healthy vegetarian yeah, yeah. food. But for a company, it's different. Right. Yeah. But for a company, it's completely different. And uh, ironically, if a company is impacted by ransomware and they're not willing to pay, the criminals have come up with a way to incentivize, incentivize them. So the criminals will threaten the company. If you don't pay us the ransom, we're not going to give you your files. We're going to give your files to everyone. We're going to leak your information, make a huge embarrassing mess for you in the media. And then your customers, that's you and me, Julian, your customers will be the victims because it would be our information that's leaked. And then we'll have to go and sue that company or uh, demand some sort of compensation from that company. And that's going to cost the company a lot more than just paying the ransom in the first place. That's the story that the criminals are now telling. And it's working for them. It's working for yeah, them, unfortunately. And, and, and they have developed, they're, they're being very professional about it because that now you have uh, even to, this as a service. You can you can rent people, you can pay people to help you do that. It's uh, it's quite impressive. And we saw recently you know, how damageable this type of attack could be when a pipeline in the US couldn't function you know, for days, threatening the energy supply of the entire West Coast. And, and how... Uh, how big is the risk for um, big systems like this? Because you would expect that this type of uh, vital systems, I mean, you know, transporting energy or transporting oil uh, throughout the country is, is something that's super well protected. So that was very astonishing for people. And you also have all these anticipation movies where a hacker takes control of an entire city or country. How real are these threats today? That's a fantastic point because what most people don't realize, what most people don't know about the attack on the colonial pipeline in the United States is that the attack originated by taking ransom, by taking control of the payment system. So the hackers were not okay. able to, dis they didn't interrupt any of the production facility. They didn't have anything to do with the, the trucks or the transportation system or the distribution system. What they were able to disrupt was the payment and the financial system, which is just one element, one system. Perhaps it was even the weakest element in that company's ecosystem. But by taking over the payment system, the company was really panicking. They didn't want to lose any revenue. They didn't want to lose control over maybe additional systems. They had to take everything offline because they had to make sure that there were no further connections between that payment system and the production system and everything else. So they actually made a very difficult decision. I wouldn't trade places with, with their chief security officers and the people that have to make this decision. They have to make a decision to announce to the public, to announce to the government, to say exactly what they're going through. And they actually paid some of the ransom. What's interesting, though, is that last week, according to the FBI and the Department of Justice in the United States, some of the ransom that was paid in Bitcoin was actually seized and recovered by the FBI. So this is something I think, um, I don't know if it's karma or something else, but because the payments are done via Bitcoin, they're actually more trackable on the blockchain. And the FBI was able to track them down until they reach a certain point. I imagine uh, an American company or an American Bitcoin exchange where the Americans could use their jurisdiction, they could use their legal power to, with a, a warrant, seize some of those funds. And that doesn't really happen a lot. You don't hear about that happening a lot. This is perhaps one of the first times that it's happened. It's interesting to see how the criminals will respond because they're very adaptable. I'm going to uh, bet that they're going to move away a little bit from Bitcoin to other cryptocurrencies, maybe Monero, which is uh, considered a little bit more anonymous or harder to track. Uh, but it's interesting to see the response. In any case, you asked how vulnerable these systems are. It's really fascinating for me as a security researcher. Some systems are vulnerable because they are complex, because they are diverse, because they have all of these different elements in them. For that company, it was the payment system. For another company that I recently heard about, uh, it was Slack. Slack was the original way that the hackers got in. Slack, for those who are unfamiliar, is a digital collaboration tool. It's a corporate communication platform that a lot of companies use. It's considered safe. It's considered secure. But a, a, a hacker was able to get into the company Slack channel. I think this was for Electronic Arts, the big video game company. And because they were on Slack, 
the support staff that was communicating with them trusted them. They said, well, if you're on the company Slack, you probably are one of us, and I'm going to give you the password reset that you required. I'm going to give you the access that you require. So that was the first step in. So it's really fascinating for me to see how the more, actually the more evolved uh, a network and a technology environment is, sometimes the more vulnerable the organization can be. But on the other hand, that's also what keeps a lot of organizations safe because they have diversity in their technology ecosystem. So they can maybe afford to take down just one system while they recover everything else. But it's not always the case. There are some companies that get hit very, very hard. And viruses, specifically ransomware viruses, are now being programmed to spread inside a network. So they're being programmed. They're they're mutating. Of course, they don't mutate on their own. They're being mutated by their creators to be more like biological viruses, to spread faster and faster and infect more and more victims. So you are, um, we can talk a little bit about hacking because as I said, you define yourself as a friendly hacker, but as a hacker, uh, what is a hacker in the first place? Because I think there is a lot of confusion around it. And and why do you think, as you, you talked about in your TED talk a few years ago, why do you think hackers are the immune system of the internet? In, in a few phrases, not in 20 minutes, sorry. So I'll try and keep it short. <laughs> I've always sure. been a hacker. I just didn't realize it. A hacker is somebody that looks at the world with curiosity. It's somebody who asks questions, somebody who always wonders what else is possible. What could we do? What happens if I take this thing apart and I put it back together in a new way? So you could call a hacker an innovator, an inventor, or maybe a trickster, somebody who maybe is clever enough so that they can pay, play tricks on people. That's another aspect of the hacker mindset. It's not necessarily malicious, though. To me, it's always been about curiosity. And that's why I proudly call myself a friendly hacker. Now, I believe that friendly hackers are like the friendly bacteria in our immune system. That's why I share that message in my TED Talk. That was my original inspiration. In in Israel, we call the, those bacteria in our ecosystem that help us thrive, we call them the friendly bacteria. So that's why I talk about friendly hackers. The reality is that there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of friendly hackers out there in the world. And just like bacteria, they work in different ways. They are different brands or types of hackers. They work individually. They're not connected, but they have an impact on all of us because they uncover vulnerabilities, they report vulnerabilities. And even the malicious hackers, even the cyber criminals help us evolve because they force us to notice a problem. They force us to create something better or demand something better from the companies that create that technology. So I think hackers really have a transformational force. And if I go back to the ideas that we started with, looking at the world with that digital dimension overlaid over everything, hackers are the ones that see the world like this. And if we're going to be that hyper-digital species of humans, like I imagine that we're going to become, We're going to need all the hackers we can get. We need people that can converse with this digital world, not just consume it, use it as it's given to us by the corporate overlords. Hackers are the ones that can take back some of that control, that can change the technology, adapt the technology. And many of us could maybe take advantage of the hacker mindset and look at the world not in read only. Look at the world as something that we can change. And it's fascinating to, I mean, I don't know very, very well this world, but it really, I find it fascinating because I see, I, I, what I imagine is that when you can see this world, as you said, you can see the matrix and it gives you such an advantage, you know, in, in understanding what's really going on, how things actually work. And uh, I had a question related to how come we vastly, you know, commonly underestimate the importance of this and the risks also related to this. And, and one of my guests interviewed Edward Snowden and um, he told, she told me that one of his conclusion was also that in the end, you know, pre- people prefer their comfort to uh, the effort of, you know, knowing what's going on and to the risk also of losing a little bit of their freedom. You know, we use Gmail because it's easy. 
uh, we use all these apps because it's easy and we don't really care in the end uh, what they do with our data when you know Snowden argues we should would you agree with this and, and you know how come we don't spend more time talking about this so I think it's true that for a lot of people we prioritize our ease of access and our comfort over more philosophical considerations like our privacy or the value of our data or the ownership of our data. That's probably true for most people. And that's where hackers are different. You know, when I participate in hacker conferences online or in the real world, I'm always impressed at how sophisticated these hackers are in their response, in their communications with the world, whether it's even by just hiding their, their face from, from cameras or by creating sophisticated, elaborate online personalities so that they can communicate with people without fear of exposing their true identity. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to live under the radar. It takes a lot of work to uh, detox yourself from the big technology companies. It would be quite a challenge for most people to live digitally, mm -hmm. but not use Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Amazon in a day. Even if, if you wanted to buy something in the store, you probably have to consider, are you going to pay digitally? Are you going to pay with cash? A lot of companies and places don't accept cash anymore. How are you going to, mm -hmm. uh, to live in a, in a world where you're not using any of these companies' products? It's quite difficult. Just, just try that for a challenge, and you'll see that within hours, you would have failed, let alone days. So I think it's true. Most of us prioritize that comfort and that ease of access. At the same time, I also want to say that as a security professional, as somebody who's worked with security technology companies, I think that we could do a much better job at making security easier and making it something that's okay. seamless, that's built in, that's not difficult or adds friction or difficulty. One, one really key thing here, just to give you a practical example, passwords. First of all, I'm on a crusade to leave passwords in the past. Passwords, we should call them. They don't belong in our future because they don't represent the daily access requirements of most people. You and I and modern individuals have to log in to between 20 to 45 different online services each day or each you know, couple of days. Maybe you're a hermit. Maybe you only have a one, one Gmail account. But most people have a lot of different accounts that they have to access. And passwords currently rely on a very volatile technology, the human memory. Very volatile technology, very untrustworthy. And at the same time, they're so easy to guess, to crack, to steal, to use. There are so many hacking tools that can crack through passwords within hours. And yet we still use them because it's easy or it's what we've always done. But I think that there is such incredible potential for an incredible new security technology that would use things like, yes, our biometric information, but also a physical hardware token that would use cryptography to verify our identity. And not just once, not just when I log in my password and the computer knows that it's me continuous authentication so that it's all, it always knows that it's me. And when I step away or when somebody tries to hijack my session, the technology would know that's not Karen. That's not me anymore. So mm -hmm. in a way, our identity is going to be the next frontier. And I, I think it's extremely exciting. I think there are some great technologies on the cusp that are going to come in and hopefully make our lives better. But we have, to, uh, we have to ditch passwords. We have to demand this. We have to sign up yeah. for multi-factor authentication. We have to accept the discomfort of punching in an additional code or using a little gadget if we want to really get rid of passwords for good. And I think it's possible. Yeah, because the, the loss of, the, the loss of uh, identity is one of the uh, most important risks because it happens when you when you when someone takes your identity online and you know it's it's a it's a situation that that's very very tricky and that that makes me think of as as you talk about security and all these uh, uh, new technologies you know to build up more security I mean some people think that because we depend so much on information and that because information depends today so much on digital technology and um, 
and you know we have and digital technology is complex and somehow fragile we have fragile systems and that therefore we should simplify meaning that in order to make our systems more resilient we shouldn't depend so much on technology because there will always be this race between security and hackers you know all these type of things so i'm thinking about you know the low tech movements or people who want to get back to analog things what is the, what is your view on this and and on the resilience of our systems and, and even of individuals within that race, since we all delegated so much of our knowledge and capabilities to our smartphones and to the cloud in general? Fantastic question. I personally think that's cool. I think it's cool. When I hear about somebody that's trying to do some low-tech experiment or low-tech, create some sort of low-tech network or any kind of thing like that, personally, I think it's really cool. I've always been really inspired by science fiction. And science fiction has driven me to become a hacker. The cyberpunk books and the movies I saw really captured my imagination. I love technology. I'm a techno-optimist. At the same time, I think there are a lot of science fiction stories that show us a future that is post-technological, where the people who survive are the ones who had adapted to living without technology in one way or another, or let's say without digital technology, because anything is te- as a, a technology. Like like yeah, Ke- sure. like Kevin Kelly will will tell you, even though he, even a hairbrush is a piece of technology that we use, even a um, a sharp stone is a technology that our ancestors used. But be, evolving to to be capable of having that resilience of not relying on digital technology, having the capacity to transfer knowledge across distances, having the capacity to generate food, to care, to create health care, to create a healthy environment, I think that's absolutely fantastic. What we've seen, though, from, from a lot of these experiments, and I think they're really cool, many of them don't work at large, large scale. So if you take, for example, I'll just give you one example, Burning Man, which is a very popular um, festival that takes place in Nevada in the United States most years, it kind of tries to create this pop-up city, this pop-up environment. And there's a lot of really cool things and art installations and music and barter, trade. There's no money. You can't use your money. You can't use your credit card. You have to trade and barter. But still, it relies on electricity. Still, people usually do bring their digital phones there, even though there's not a lot of coverage there. And after a few days, it has to stop. Would they, you know, would, would it be possible to live in a society like, like Burning Man, like Black Rock City, which is the city they set up each year? Would it be something that people could live in for, for weeks, for months, without a form of communication with the outside world? I'm not sure. But isn't that, isn't it what we had just before the internet? You know, we didn't have digital technology and still we had, modern societies yeah i'm not talking about the fact that you know that would be ideal i'm talking about those that are saying okay we are if we continue with that race that we end up making our systems so fragile because they are so complex and interconnected and no one actually understands how it works like try to fix your car today versus your car 40 years ago you see my point and and, and it was working somehow so is, is this a way forward or you think any way we've been too far already and, and it, you know, it's, a, it's the, the only way forward is m- just more digital technology and maybe with the risk of having more concentration of power? So firstly, I'd say that I drive a mostly analog car and it's old. <laughs> I mean, old compared to all of the other cars in, in, in my neighborhood's parking lot. It's not ancient, right? It's not from the 50s or 60s, but it's it's still quite analog. And I'm going to drive it for as long as I can. I'm not going to claim I can fix it myself, but I'm going to drive it for as long as I can. Uh, this is a really fascinating argument. I think I think it's really cool when people try and live life without digital technology. At the yeah. same time, Yes, we could go back to the 19th century or, you know, a pre-internet all age. The, or the 60s, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But I do think about all of the incredible benefits that digital connectivity sure. and the internet has brought us. And specifically in the areas of science, technology, education, healthcare, it's improved people's lives incredibly, billions of people's lives. Yeah access to science, to technology, to education, to better healthcare because of digital technology. So 
And if I look at it from, from a big, big picture, as a, as a species, I think we have more benefited from digital technology. And maybe we shouldn't say that we lost something. Rather, we evolved. And we're now a digital yeah. species. And we, we, we co-live with our digital technology. We are symbionts. And I, I guess the interesting way forward is to keep that, but make sure that we build the the right level of security or that we choose, you know, what technology is actually um, progress, you know, versus just doing it for the sake of doing it. But this is the same question with all technological, you know, do you do you do it because you can or do you do it because you, you should? That's why I think we'll always need a hacker mindset. We always are going to need the people that can show us the vulnerabilities, that can force us to evolve, that can crack a technology, even if it was created by a very powerful corporate. People who can subvert technology are always going to have a role in the future of humanity, whether it's digital technology or analog technology. Clever people will always have a place to play when it comes to technology. And, and that's why I think we need hackers. Thanks a lot. Let's let's finish on this, yeah. Karen. Thanks a lot for your time. I think that's a good conclusion. And uh, thanks for being a hacker and, and being out there. Thank you, Julianne. Thank you, all the listeners. Hack the planet. I'm wishing you only <laughs> the best things in your digital and your analog lives. Voilà, j'espère que cet épisode vous a plu. Vous pouvez, comme d'habitude, retrouver les notes détaillées et les infos complémentaires sur sismic.fr. Si le podcast vous plaît, parlez-en, mettez une note sur Apple Podcasts. Et pour ne rien rater, rejoignez-moi sur les réseaux sociaux ou abonnez-vous à la newsletter. Je suis Julien Devorex, Sismic est un podcast indépendant et je me consacre désormais entièrement à ce projet. Pour me soutenir dans cette démarche et rejoindre la communauté privée Slack, vous pouvez faire un don à partir du site. Enfin, si vous souhaitez échanger avec moi ou me solliciter pour une conférence, contactez-moi pour en parler. Merci encore pour votre écoute et à bientôt dans un autre épisode. <rire> Changer le monde <rire> Quelle drôle idée il est très bien comme ça, le monde pourrait changer. <rire> <rire>